Hello, this is Dr. Jason Munsell. It is uh, almost 3 o'clock on Thursday, um, July 10th, 2014. Um, this is the recorded lecture for Chapter 2 in our textbook, and uh, it's, it's pretty hefty. Um, there's a lot of uh, really information, uh, really good information in here. Um, but it's sometimes a little bit hard to unpack. Uh, I, I mentioned, um, I think in an email or, or a Tumblr uh, blog that this was, uh, or Twitter, they all run together, don't they? Um, that um, uh, I think this is really written at sort of a grad school level and it sort of assumes a lot of uh, knowledge about various things. So I'll try my best to unpack uh, some of this stuff so you get it. Um, uh, but generally speaking, um, I think they put this as a chapter two because uh, issues of privacy, uh, particularly when it comes to um, uh, the, the forging and maintaining of uh, interpersonal relationships online is, is unbelievably important. Um, so let's get through this. Uh, slide two here, uh, again, this entire chapter is all about privacy management. Um, the first part of the chapter, obviously, is just sort of a little bit of an introduction. It has a, a anecdotal uh, little evidence in there. I don't know if they made it up or not. Um, and uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting here is that Child, and that is the, um, the author of, of the book, uh, or not, the author of the chapter, not, not an actual child. Uh, I think his name is Jeff. Um, I do not know who Jeff Child is. Um, but I'm sure he's a fine, fine gentleman. Jeffrey T. That's his name. And Sandra uh, Petronio. I know neither of them. Um, I, never mind. Um, so one, one thing that I think was pretty interesting is that they more closely define uh, social networking sites, or SNS, again, um, more closely, or, or they define it more specifically than the uh, previous chapter uh, did. And so this is what they say, is that uh, an SNS, or again, a social networking site, is a construction of a profile in a system that can be bounded or restricted if desired, two, inclusion of others with whom they share some type of connection, and finally, three, uh, viewership and surfing capabilities among the list of contracts if desired. And uh, also, um, they uh, talk about beer, not, not beer, beer, but beer, um, the author. And one of the things that beer uh, argues is that we need to start uh, more closely differentiating between all these different types of um, social networking sites. Um, even though it is all CMC and, and all, <laughs> my dog is sneezing, and uh, all uh, social networking sites are part of, of CMC. Um, I think as we, this, this is sort of a new science, right? It's, it's a, you know, as communication studies scholars, uh, we're getting to, uh, to know it uh, and, and research it a lot, uh, a lot more these days. But it's a, a new area. And so as we uh, get into this, I think folks will have more classifications or a different typology. Uh, for different types of uh, CMC or different types of social networking sites. Facebook being a certain type and that's different from Twitter, that's different from blogging, that's different from just surfing or whatever. So, um, And then the larger point then becomes that if you look at these different areas uh, as sort of almost their own little cultures, um, they're going to have different cultural norms and values of privacy. Uh, norms and values of privacy on Facebook might be different from norms and values of privacy on Twitter, uh, which might be different from Vine or Instagram or whatever. Um, so that's sort of the initial stuff. Um, and then uh, they talk about, uh, before they get into the whole communication privacy management theory, um, General modes of privacy. So this is, I'm on slide number three now. And so generally they say there are folks who have very closed boundaries. That is, I don't want to tell you a whole lot about me. Uh, very open uh, boundaries. I'm an open book. You can know, you know, I'll tell you whatever you want to know. Or the, you know, the in-betweens. Um, 
And some of the general research that these authors offer, again, before they get into the, the main stuff, the main theoretical stuff they want to talk about, is that uh, younger folks, but they don't really define that, um, but tend to actually to be more private uh, than adults, maybe just because they've had a lot more um, experience with stuff. Um, but adults, obviously, are, are catching up. Um, and also, uh, they... Uh, want us, obviously, and the, the important sort of takeaway before we actually get to the stuff is that we need to be a lot more aware of uh, privacy issues. Um, and I do think that a lot of us don't think a lot about it. Um, I don't think about it as nearly as much as I ought to, um, so, so I'm learning. Um, but remember that Facebook, uh, Twitter, all these things are, are companies, uh, and they make money and they make money through advertisement and stuff like that. So uh, the more stuff we share, the more um, sort of you know, money they can make, I suppose. But we need to be very, very careful about uh, uh, these privacy issues online. Uh, it can really make or break us um, when it comes to uh, our personal relationships, work, uh, all of the above. Um, and they also say that Twitter uh, uh, tends to be uh, a little bit more open um, than like Facebook and stuff like that, but that perhaps is because uh, we can have code names and stuff and, and we don't have to put our profiles and, we, and there's just 140 characters. Um, that's, that's, sort of, that's sort of interesting. Um, I don't know why they threw it in there, but they just said that you know, Twitter is a little bit different. And so then, then the uh, then child and uh, Petronio, Petronio uh, offer this um, big old theory. And this is the theory that's really hard to unpack. And this is slide four. The Communication Privacy Management Theory, or CPM. And so now we have CPM along with CMC and SNS. And as I say on the slide, O-M-G-L-O-L. Will you be my BFF? Okay, so this is the theory. Very sciencey, as I say there. Remember, these folks are social scientists. Um, so a lot of empirical research, a lot of uh, data from uh, surveys and interviews and all that type of stuff. So they're interested in predicting things. What would happen if? Um, and so basically what the authors here are saying is that, uh, or what they're asking, can we take the communication privacy management theory and all its various facets and apply it to the decisions people are making about what to offer and what not to offer uh, online. So that's really what this, uh, this whole thing is uh, all about. Um, but the whole communication privacy management theory is pretty uh, complicated and there's lots of little nuances to it. So slide uh, five, <laughs> so what is uh, CMP, uh, C, I can't even say it now, CPM, in a nutshell, and there's a picture of a nutshell, okay. Uh, slide six, the basics. So what this theory really is all about, or tries to, to explain, is how people manage their uh, private information both their own information and other people's information that are disclosed to us. I'm also responsible for what somebody else tells me. Uh, concerns both effective ways to manage privacy, but this theory is also concerned with the mistakes that people make. Um, this theory appreciates this tension that we always have between our need to disclose information because we have to. Um, to create relationships, to maintain relationships, to grow relationships, to end relationships. Um, so we have to have this need to disclose, but we also have obviously this need for privacy. Um, so there's always that tension there. Next, um, there's this idea that uh, we, and this is also moves into the principles, but uh, appreciates the idea 
uh, individual ownership of information. Like I own uh, the information about myself. And then once it's disclosed to other people, there's sort of the collective ownership. And um, so th those are basic ideas here about the, uh, the CPM or SMM um, theory. Given that, then what our authors offer are five principles of this particular theory, the CPM theory. Um, theory or principle number one, and now I'm on slide number seven. Principle one. Individuals equate private information with personal ownership. So just like the information about me is like I, I own it, like I own my car, which I don't because I'm still paying for it, or a shirt. Um, I, I own this stuff. Um, I say I would never share my shirt with all the people online. I would be a big shirt. So, but we have this sense that we own this information. Two, principle two, is this idea that since we think we own this information, that we have the right to control it and to control the flow of it. Um, I have a little example there of uh, pictures that I took of, of myself and, and other people um, uh, when my wife and I went to the Virgin Islands a, a few weeks ago. Uh, th this sort of um, theory would assume that I, I own, I feel like I own this information and uh, I can control it, even though we all know that you know other people, as I say here, could very easily uh, steal the photos and Photoshop it and um, and then post it, you know, wherever. So we never really have control. But the assumption is that we think we have control or we have the right to control that information. Principle number three. Uh, thus, in light of those first two principles, that we own the information, we have the right to, to, you know, to do with it what we want, the right to control it, we develop these various strategies to try to control that flow of information, uh, to control our private, personal information. And this is very complicated because people do it differently. <laughs> As I said, I have my little different strokes uh, reference. Uh, what you're talking about, witness? Oh, uh, so basically, there's lots of different uh, uh, differences here. I'll let you read some of the specifics, but some of the personal differences uh, include higher versus lower self-monitoring folks. Self-monitoring, uh, if you've taken interpersonal class or other classes, basically how. Um, how closely you monitor your own communication and your own behavior. Some of us don't really think, well, some of us don't think before we speak, right? And that's just basically what it is. So, so, so how high or low we are when it comes to self-monitoring uh, is going to impact um, how we, uh, we deal with and make decisions about um, uh, privacy issues and how to control our own private uh, information. Um, there was some interesting stuff in here. I mean, there's, this, this chapter is jam-packed with stuff, and I'm sort of a, a big-picture type of person. Um, but the, um, and, and there's more about self-monitoring uh, later on. Um, but, you know, there's just this, this, this notion, um, well, I'll, I'll get into the other stuff uh, Later, but this this notion that you know you depending on the situation, uh, depending on if whether it's a blog or Facebook or something like that, um, people who are high self monitoring tend to be a, a little bit more careful about things. Um, but also then, oftentimes because they have thought about everything, they tend to share more information on blogs. It's really quite kind of interesting. Anyway, so we got the self monitoring is, is one sort of aspect of the decisions. 
uh, cultural expectations, um, what, what is uh, expe expected with